Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Rebecca, and I'm happy to share with you my project that I've been working on in the discipline of the sociology of education, um, entitled "A Discourse Analysis on Multicultural or A Discourse Analysis on Opposition to Multicultural Education Using the Case Study of the Arizona Ban." on ethnic studies. So first to begin, what is multicultural education? It basically includes different educational and teaching practices that incorporate the cultures, perspectives, the histories, and the fiction and nonfiction texts of people from various cultural backgrounds. Multicultural education um, has been proven to have a number of benefits, um, especially for students of color. They perform better academically um, on external measures, such as test scores and graduation rates. Um, it helps teachers relate better to their students through the content that the teachers themselves um, you know, are learning and delivering to their students. Um, and students of color exposed to multicultural education, they're more motivated, typically, um, have been shown in studies to succeed in school um, and, you know, go off to college. Um, a main premise of this research kind of began with, um, due to the research that's been previously done, is that multicultural education is good. Um, it has many benefits, and we should have more of it. However, many people are opposed to multicultural education in schools, um, and they actively work to against it, against its pro proliferation in schools. And I was kind of um, struck with this fact and wondering why that is. So basically, I approached this question using the Arizona ban on ethnic studies um, as a case study to um, really get at this question. So in 1997, the Tucson Unified School District began offering what were called Mexican American Studies. These were optional courses that students could take to replace their more traditional um, American history and American government courses. They had a specifically Mexican American uh, focus and perspective through which um, the content and the, the instruction was delivered. So this case, um, there. Uh, regarding this case, there was strong evidence supporting the Mexican American Studies program in particular. Um, so not just multicultural education is good, but this specific program was very beneficial to the students who were a part of it. This case was politically charged. There were large protests and demonstrations both for and against this ban on ethnic studies. There was also a lot of media attention surrounding the event. So I, I kind of approached this with the question, you know, how do those opposed to ethnic studies argue their case given that um, ethnic studies are so beneficial to students. What are the kinds of arguments that people are using to persuade people otherwise? Um, my specific research questions, one, two, and three, um, were kind of trying to get at what characterized the specific rhetoric against ethnic studies. Were there any variations in the frequency um, in arguments um, delivered to local audiences versus national audiences? And finally, did the arguments used kind of reflect trends in national rhetoric regarding race and ethnicity in the United States? So I approached this with the mixed method, um, first using content analysis, which is basically you go through um, kind of different media sources to code um, for specific information, and it's supposed to really give you a qualitative idea of different patterns that you might be seeing quantitatively. Um, I used content analysis to guide my data collection process um, and also the coding framework in order to analyze the different di discourse um, into units. The second methodology I used was a critical discourse analysis. So critical discourse analysis really approaches rhetoric with the idea that we cannot take what people say at face value. Um, and this is very frequent in our political discourse as people, you know, kind of try to spin, overemphasize, underemphasize different things in order to make their point. So um, the critical discourse analysis specifically guided the data analysis process of this project. A brief overview of my data sources included various TV and radio, radio interviews, press conferences and speeches, and written statements and, and op-eds. So audio data, audiovisual data, and written data. My data sources included seven local and five national sources, most of them being um, media companies. Finally, my data sources also included six very specific public actors um, associated with this event. They were chosen on a number of specifications, including one, their affiliation to the specific Arizona case, two, their opposition, their stated opposition to the Mex Mexican American Studies courses, and um, three, whether or not there was recorded discourse information um, from them. So my data coding process ended up um, 
kind of separating into two different kinds of discourse that really emerged through the data. First was dis were the discourse tactics. And these are kind of very general um, things that we use in our day-to-day -day speech, especially in arguments, in order to enhance our own arguments um, and you know, de-enhance um, the arguments of the people that we are opposed to. So these are just very, very generalized um, statements to increase one's own credibility and decrease the credibility of others. That is not the main focus of this study. The main focus were actually the, discor the discursive arguments used, the specific reasons um, these actors wanted to uh, ban the ethnic studies courses. They all answer the questions, why should we ban ethnic studies? This is what that process kind of looked like. Um, my gel pens that I got in middle school finally went to good use. <laughs> um, and so basically I had a written transcribed data of all of the discourse used for this study and then I coded it um, according to my framework. So the discursive arguments, um, I found um, 379 total data points and a data point in this study is a um, phrase or a sentence that um, states some sort of reason for opposition to ethnic studies. There were 15 of those found, and 60% of the data came from national sources, and I came from local sources, I apologize. And about 40% uh, of the data came from national sources, so a little more um, weighted towards the local data. These were all 15 discursive arguments. Don't read them. <laughs> Um, ask me about it later. <laughs> so basically in terms of my first research question on what characterized the rhetoric against the Mexican American Studies program, I found um, these four arguments were uh, most predominant throughout the research. Things like um, the fact that the ethnic studies teaches students to see the world in racialized terms, um, that they teach students to see themselves um, as oppressed and victims of a sort of power structure in the United States, um, that the classes actually segregate students based on race and ethnicity, and that the classes teach students to see each other in terms of racial identity rather than other um, sort of individualized characteristics. And here I just want to point out um, that through my research I did find that all of the discursive arguments made by these political actors were either um, partially or entirely misleading or untrue. Um, so these are statements that, um, through kind of further exam examination, were unsubstantiated, and yet these political actors were using them um, kind of in their rhetoric against ethnic studies. So in terms of my second research question, um, I did find a little bit of variation in the different arguments that were made at the local and national level, um, and I found this through kind of comparing the frequencies with which all of the arguments were made at the local and national level. Um, and in my paper, I kind of go into the different reasons why these uh, differences may have occurred. Okay, so this is kind of the heart of my project, really trying to uh, find these different, uh, what I termed rhetorical themes in the discourse against um, multicultural education and ethnic studies in this Arizona case. I found two predominant rhetorical themes kind of emerged through the data. The first was um, related to colorblind, uh, racial colorblindness, and the second was related to kind of anti-American rhetoric. So first, the colorblind rhetorical theme. Colorblindness is this um, idea that race and ethnicity are no longer a significant social category in the United States um, that defines people. So it kind of says that race and ethnicity do not define life outcomes, um, and often argues that racial considerations um, at all are racist, even against uh, white people. For example, um, many of the arguments surrounding affirmative action these days. Uh, colorblind rhetoric, rhetoric also includes um, appeals to a sort of abstract liberalism, which includes, um, you know, this kind of idealization of individualism and equal opportunity, um, and it really assumes that everyone kind of begins life on an equal footing um, and has the same potential to have equal life outcomes. However, we know that this is actually not true. Um, common things you might hear through colorblind um, rhetoric are things like, I don't see color, affirmative action is racist, um, you know, an individual identity is more important than racial identity. And this last one is actually quite interesting because many people do hold their um, ethnic and racial identities as like very important to them. So it also kind of diminishes and minimizes people's own kind of ability and desire to identify as they wish if it happens to be with a race or ethnicity. So these five specific um, arguments that these were the some of the discursive arguments that were on that page of 15 a couple slides ago. So these all specifically relate to colorblind um, discursive and rhetorical um, 
tactics. And kind of pulling all of these different arguments together, they accumulate to 42.5% of the total data um, that kind of emerged in this discourse analysis, which is quite significant. So we can kind of definitely confirm that First, when um, people are trying to argue against ethnic studies courses, they're arguing from a point of view that says we shouldn't um, see race, we shouldn't talk about race, we shouldn't talk about racial or ethnic differences. The second rhetorical theme um, had to do with this idea of anti-Americanism. Um, Anti-Americanism um, with regards to people of color is actually very quite historically founded. Um, Mexican Americans um, were treated legally white when the, um, portions of Mexico actually became part of the United States. Um, however, they were treated socially non-white. Um, people of color in the United States in general are seen as less American. We have studies saying that, you know, how people associate um, different individuals with the term American, with things like American values. Um, and immigration debates cast Latinos as illegal and un-American. So kind of beginning with this, um, and general arguments that pers this perspectives, values, and cultures of people of color um, are non-traditional, they are un-American, and sometimes anti-American. This emerged quite clearly through the data as well. These um, specific discursive arguments all relate in some way to, the ex to accusing the ethnic studies program of being kind of opposed to traditional American values um, and anti-American themselves. Some um, of these arguments you know, related to the accusation that the courses taught students to feel oppressed and victimized um, and kind of othered the, that Mexican American studies, um, you know, indoctrinated into certain ideologies, that the courses were communist and leftist and Marxist and all of these different arguments that really tried to cast the ethnic studies courses into um, this kind of anti-American, um, course and, and method of teaching that we shouldn't have in our American public schools. So finally, um, I was able to conclude through this research that the arguments against ethnic studies, they ref do reflect national rhetoric on race and ethnicity in the United States in quite clear ways. Um, and this was specifically um, through the different um, colorblind racial discourse and anti or un-American racial discourse that was attached to these ethnic studies programs through the discourse of the political actors. Okay, I'm, I'm like right on time. Thank you. Yes. Um, have you seen any, or I don't know if you look at this, um, it's probably a totally different research question, but um, you look at like, any, any similar kinds of rhetoric in like university systems looking at um, identity-based studies as well, or is that something you didn't have a chance to look at? That's certainly something that could be done, but was absolutely beyond the scope of this specific yeah. study. <laughs> yes. Um, that's a great question. Kind of going back to the different um, things that I wrote about this case in particular, you know, it was very politically charged. There was a lot of attention and therefore a lot of um, kind of discourse and data available. Um, and it also got kind of national media attention. So it wasn't kind of just like a localized issue. Yes? I don't suppose there's just anybody who was arguing for or against rather than the fact that, of course, that nature could be taught to everyone, not just the Mexican Americans. Oh, of course. All students had the um, option in this specific case and in all cases to take the courses if they want. Yeah. But did people bring that up that when, they were in, when you were looking through some of them? Yeah, there was, a, there was some really interesting rhetoric that actually accused the ethnic studies courses of racially segregating students that was just blatantly wrong. Um, students had the option to take them if they wanted to or not. Um, yeah. So I think that kind of relates to your question. Yes? What about having a dissection of a legitimate American history course? It's part of American history. Next go deal, you know, it's suffering. Yes, and that, right, and that was one of the reasons that this kind but of, why that. Why can't that just be fed into a regular American history course? Is it, and what's happening now in Arizona? Right, great question. That was an argument that was made. Um, sort of infrequently, but it was there that this information could be incorporated into the regular American history courses. Um, I found that no effort had ever or was being taken, or was being undertaken in this case um, to do that, and it was mainly like a, another rhetorical method that was used. It's possible, but it is infrequently done. Other than the abundance of people arguing things that appear to be wrong, what surprised you most in your findings? 
Um, certainly the discourse on the ethnic studies being somehow communist <laughs> um, and uh, anti-free enterprise, it was just, it was kind of a funny finding. Um, they really kind of threw the kitchen sink at ethnic studies and pulled at all of the different fears um, and kind of played to the different fears that people possibly had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One other question. Um, what was the background of the people mostly arguing against? Um, yeah, I can go back a couple slides yeah, to that. that no, that's fine. I tried to breeze through these a couple kind of quickly. So the political actors whose discourse that I studied um, were two successive superintendents of education. So these are, you know, the head people um, of education in the schools. And these two people were actually instrumental in. Um, kind of guiding the ban on ethnic studies in Arizona. Also the assistant superintendent, a former Mexican-American studies teacher, um, a kind of writer for a and like an online news source, um, and also a federal liaison for the Department of Education. Okay, any last questions? I think we should wrap up. So just a comment, I mean, in our, I mean, having taught in Arizona for a long time, I can tell you how politically charged this is, but it's also, it's very specific to a particular kind of political and social environment. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I, I wonder if the meanings of this would be very different in different sections of the country. The other thing is, on the American history front, almost every American history course now has a very significant um, eth ethnicity, race, gender dimension to it. It's just been incorporated for probably a generation. Hmm. Okay. Thank you.